So, so we start. Uh, first, uh, welcome to the, the crowd. Welcome to the panelists. Thank you for joining us. Um, what we're talking today is uh, about monetization on numbers, people and tools. And uh, we have on stage um, a fairly good group, really good group, uh, that I just want to introduce. Hey. <laughs> so I want to start with Dan Lagani, who is the chief revenue officer and president of Glam Media. And here I start, uh, most of you have heard that Glam Media is named now Mode Media. And uh, so Dan will talk about this uh, a little later on. Um, to give a short introduction on Dan, he has led large-scale organizations as driving force behind digital transformation of some media brands, and this is really good brands. Reader's Digest, Women's Wear Daily, Better Homes and Gardens, and the Condé Nast Bridal Group. Uh, as president and chief revenue officer, he's responsible for Clam Media's and now Mode Media's revenue, including strategic sales, brand strategy and client solutions, and also for media agency relations in the North America. Is this okay? Yeah? It's perfect. Thank you. So then we have Serge. I, I go on with Serge Mata. Uh, Serge is the CEO of Comscore, and uh, Serge joins Comscore shortly after its interception in 99. This is true. And uh, he began his career in product management. After that, he served as president of commercial services, but before he was responsible for mobile solutions, though we talk a lot about mobile today and uh, about data, and uh, so he's instrumental in the expansion of Comscore's telecom solutions globally. This was also one of his jobs. Today he's focused on developing Comscore's global product and business strategy. Yeah, is this? Thank you. Okay. So now we go on with Chris Cunningham. Chris in the middle. Uh, Chris is the co-founder and CEO of App Savvy, and uh, App Savvy is new delivery and reception of web and uh, mobile advertisement. Um, Chris co-founded uh, App Savvy in 2008, and uh, the goal is very simple: disrupting brand advertising by putting people at the center. Is this a fair uh, statement? We'll take that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, under his leadership, App Savvy was awarded several times as a great place to work by Grain's New York best Business Best Places to Work. And this is one point we want also want to talk about. So people that you hire, people that you have, uh, all of you, and, and that you bring on board, skill sets that you need, and how you go forward. I continue with Robert, R Robert Locasio, founder and CEO of Live Person. And uh, here, uh, Robert, he found Live Person in 98. Um, prior in to 95, life, 95, 95 already. Oh, I said 98. Okay, 95. And uh, Robert, anything? <laughs> Robert uh, is very passionate about community and helping others. So he founded Feeding New York City, a volunteer based organization which delivers Thanksgiving Day meals to thousands of families in need throughout New York City. So I think this is remarkable that you do that, and uh, I want to mention that. Other than uh, for life person, thank you. It's giving to people. Life person is a real-time intelligent customer engagement platform and tool, and we'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, so last but not least, Tal Keenan as a co-founder and CEO of AdExtend. Uh, Ad Extent is a retargeting tech platform, and uh, Tal founded uh, uh, Ad Extent in 2010. And uh, in 2010, he also was elected to Bloomberg's inaugural class of New York City Venture Fellows. This also is true. Um, so we have a, a group that is uh, quite different, and uh, they have different tasks to do. And um, our topic today, and this is my last remarks, is on monetization. So monetization mechanisms change, monetiz advertising is changing completely in transformation. This is what we want to talk about. So the question is, is there anything else than Google, or is there only Google that we can work with? And all of them have an has an answer to that. Uh, 
Uh, also, advertising platforms need to improve the delivery of ads. This is what, what you, most of you work on. Um, so how do we reach the, the, our customer? How do we reach people? How do we reach new customer? This is mainly what we're talking about. So innovative tools and mechanisms, this is what all of you are working on and how you show us how situations go forward. And uh, with that also, the usage of data, uh, all of your companies own, have a lot of data, produce data more and more. This is also what we want to talk about, how you use data and then what comes out with data. Um, so my first question and uh, something that we discussed prior to, to this panel was uh, whenever some of you has an answer to, to a question I asked to anybody else, please jump in, feel free to jump in and discuss that. So my first question is, what does customer centricity mean for your business? So and then I start here with Mode Media with Clam. Perhaps before starting answering the question, say something to Mode Media. Thrilled to do it. By the way, I loved the, uh, you captured me perfectly in the visual over there, which was the outline of, uh, uh, of a silhouette. So I, I think it was uh, um, also with the glam name underneath. It's been a big 48 hours. Mode Media is the new name of the company that started 10 years ago uh, on a piece of paper as at that time something that Samir Aurora and some of the other founders had identified as Project X. And eight years ago, the company went live. And at, at that time, the fundamental mission, which really hasn't changed, which was to take what was happening in digital content, which was the continued uh, ag disaggregation of audiences, and bring it back together in a simple way for advertisers. That idea really started out around fashion and beauty and style, and the name Glam was a wonderful name. Well, over time, we developed the business so that it's very well um, represented across seven content categories, including food and men's lifestyle and health and wellness. So truthfully, the name mode really is catching up with where the business had already gone. And it's a name that we own globally, so it was an exciting, important day for us to start to make more clearly uh, known in the market what the company stands for and all the categories we, can, we operate in. So that it means exactly uh, the customer centricity that you say, hey, our customers not only glam, it's it's more than glam, and it's it's more it's foody, it's it's all the other. Stuff. Yeah, it, very certainly, um, customer, I, I, and I think I, I'd be surprised if anybody in the panel felt differently. It has to be at the core of what your business model is. Um, by and large, we have been. For a brand that is, and, and I'll, I'll pitch Comscore here for a second, for a brand that is I am happy for. a Comscore top 10 brand in terms of the number of consumers that come through our sites on any given month, we are the least known uh, because we're not fundamentally a consumer solution. We are a solution for the biggest marketers in the world to buy advertising. But okay. it's, uh, it's an important part of our business. It's just that our customers are, are the advertising community to the greatest degree at this moment in time. Well, let's go on with a question to, to Serge. So yeah, Comscore. You know, for us, um, I, I think um, for the folks that don't know what Comscore does, um, we're a data analytics company. We're an independent third-party measurement firm. And we, um, we measure every single platform out there, be it uh, PC, be it mobile, smartphones, tablets, TV over the top, you name it, um, we're your independent third-party measurement firm on a global basis. Um, in terms of the customer centricity perspective, clearly we as a, as a company have to be listening to our customers or else we would have never been this successful. Um, now, now granted, and it might be a bit controversial, but we obviously listen to, we value every single customer of ours, but uh, clearly the big media companies um, have a huge, huge impact on this ecosystem that um, we listen to, to those guys and to the agencies um, quite a bit because they have such influence of what's going on in the business. So, you know, a great example is a couple of years ago, we were only just a PC-based service. Then they told us, no, you need to go to mobile. Now, if you go in and just say, 
we're just PC or we're just mobile or we have tablets, they look at you funny because now everything, everything, everybody is talking about is cross-platform and cross-device. So you have to, you have to listen to the customers and you have to sing, but again, not, not to sound too controversial, but not every single customer has, uh, they have different weights, if you can, uh, I'm sure you understand. Okay, Chris, app savvy, yep. customer centricity, how do you see that? Sure, so our, um, our, our belief uh, is that the last 20 years of advertising, digital advertising, has been focused on the wrong metrics. It's been focused on pages and impressions, which most people tend to ignore. Um, it's focused on getting people to click on things which they generally don't want to. And the way that ads generally get triggered are page views. Um, and that's a very demand-focused mentality. That's what's good for the advertiser. Uh, how to uh, effectively intro introduce an ad at the wrong time. The way that we think is maybe a more thoughtful way is working with the publisher or the app developer. It could be an ISC property, it could be New York Times. Um, and asking the publisher, what do people do on your site? Do they share articles? Do they comment? Do they swipe? Do they load? So we call this act activity. Everyone in this room is probably doing some sort of natural and native behavior on the app that they're on before they take their Uber car. And all of those are missed opportunities to trigger advertising because we're so fixated on putting ads in the wrong placements on web and essentially uh, delivering ads at the wrong places in mobile. So um, around the customer, the question starts with the developer or the publisher. What do people do? What's good for the user? And the next question we like to ask is, what's the natural break? Um, television has created a natural break. It's called a 30-second spot. And over the last 60 years, we've learned to live with it. Whether you DVR it, whether you go make a sandwich and you ignore the ad, you understand what the 30-second spot is. In mobile, there's a tremendous opportunity to identify natural breaks per publisher. Um, and what that opens up is a time. It's all about timing when a user is going to be more open to uh, receiving an ad. So custom, the customer century question is really focused on what's the best time to reach a consumer. Okay. So I, I go on with Robert. Yeah. I, when I look today, I mean, we work with the largest brands. We, we provide the chat that's on the websites, and we've been doing it since 98 was when the, the product got launched. But there's been a huge shift. The, the consumers have a lot more power than they ever have. And we see it with our brands, whether it's AT&T or J. Crew or our customers. The consumer lives outside their web, I mean, outside their website, and they have a voice. Mm -hmm. And so it scares the hell out of the business because no longer do they have to call them to get help. They just go out and they tweet, I hate this brand. Mm -hmm. And if you see a couple years ago, this guy from United, they ruined his guitar. He basically created a video on YouTube. Millions of people saw this, and it really caught United by surprise. So today, the customer lives outside of that of their touch and they're reactive that's what's happening the brands are reactive so now what they're looking for is how can we be proactive how can we reach them and then how can we create a relationship with them because google today i think the evil of google is that they are in between you and your customer even if the, someone bought from you they go back to google again and that's an intermediary to the brand's relationship so today i think they're looking at how do we create a relationship with the consumer okay Tall, retargeting platform, this yeah. is what, what uh, AdExcent is doing. So uh, how do you see customer centricity? So um, AdExcent provide flexible retargeting technology for large brand agencies, trading desks. Um, our focus is uh, data audience management and creative optimization. So for us, first of all, how many people know what retargeting is? Okay, so retargeting is this concept of the ads that runs after you once you leave a site. So you go, for some reason, everyone talks about Zappos. So you go to Zappos, you look at shoes, you don't buy them, and then you see those damn shoes again and again across the web. So when we think about um, uh, customer centricity, I actually, I don't think about my customer. I think about my customer's customers. Mm -hmm. And what are our platforms supposed to do is to identify the, and differentiate between one visitor to a site like Zappos and the next. And the goal is to optimize advertising budget so that you don't end up spending too much money on those who don't convert. So our platform, that's its core focus. It's being able to differentiate users 
being able to spend more on the, the ones that are more likely to convert. So after that, we, you all have customer data. You have amounts of customer data. So how, how do you work with this customer data? And, and what does it mean for you? Because when we go a step on and talk about big data, uh, that we have all that, how is big data going to monetize? I start with Chris. So, um, I'll, just, I'll take a different uh, pass at the, uh, at the question. Overall, I think most publishers are uh, pretty focused on the data that they own. So in most cases, people use the cookie, which is who, uh, it's the who, right? And Facebook, yeah. Facebook and Twitter, any owned and operated business knows who the user is. But perhaps, and it's just a, you know, sort of a thesis, um, you can know as much about who the user is, but to the retargeting point, if you're hitting them at the wrong time, they don't want to see your ad. So now, let's suppose the who is the half glass full. Um, I don't have enough energy to pour half a glass of water in there. Um, but now if you know the, the when, which is um, <clears throat> back to that natural break point, they just did something, they're open, they're in the elevator, they're walking to a taxi, there's a, there's a moment that they're going to be more receptive. Um, and then the, the third piece would be the, the location, right? And that's Drawbridge or Foursquare. And all these companies have enormous amount of data on location. The problem is most companies, including App Savvy, so we're, gu we're guilty of it, everyone sells their own data value prop. But essentially what you're getting is a glass with only, ha or take your favorite cocktail, it's only one mixture. So what's interesting to me is how do we leverage multiple data sources that essentially offer the who, the when, and the location, because ultimately if it's back to the customer and we've heard the users first, and that's how arguably the most successful technology companies on the planet, why they're successful, they put user first. How do we do that rather than being biased to the, o the, the, the data that we own and manage? So uh, Google owning most of the data, uh, this is the ones who own the most and the ones who take most of the data and the one who take most out of that? Do you agree on that? No, probably not. No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, so f from our perspective, obviously we own a lot of data and we own our data of our own, but we own a ton of customer data. Um, we have every, we have millions and millions and millions of websites that actually allow us and on their apps and on their mobile websites that allow to instrument on their website to put a tag so that we can get everything about um, that's happening on that th on that website on a s on a global scale on a census basis versus a versus a panel, um, but more and more what you're also seeing from an advertising perspective is the big guys, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoos of the worlds are also seeing the need of sharing their own data to the independent third parties like ourselves because it's in their benefit. So we just struck a deal earlier this year with Google. We struck a deal just yesterday with Yahoo. So those guys are providing us some of their data. Now we integrate it with other stuff, uh, with other sources, but it provides everyone the scale, but it, you need the independent third party. You can't just rely on them. Um, because then the advertisers will look at you funny if it's just coming directly from Google or directly from Yahoo. You know, it's interesting though, is Chris made the comment a second ago about that most publishers are guilty of going in with only half the glass because they're going in with their first party story. But back to the question you asked about customer centricity, that's increasingly what we get asked for. Because if I were to say the generic comment that we hear from the advertising community at Mode is, and in our business we have 5,000 sites that are part of the distributed content platform. The general comment is, I can get third party data from any number of sources. The value proposition that you at Mode bring in is some interesting first party insights that you can provide. So I, in, in some respects, I think the advertising community is actually driving that half full comment because what they push for regularly is something that they can't get through a third party resource like a Blue Kai or a Quantcast or some other uh, you know, uh, thing that others can provide them. Yeah, and I, I think the data, we, we monitor all the data on the website. So we're monitoring about 600 million uniques a month, but only the data on the last mile. And when you see that data, and you can run the predictive models on it, because we predict and then we target the chat for conversion, we get about a 25% conversion rate. 
So that last mile of data actually, I think, has a lot more value if you connect it with what Google's seeing, then you see what's on the website, what products they're looking at, if they've been back here before at the website, and then how much they've spent. That's the data that we see, and, and it's a very powerful set of data that I don't think the Googles have yet, you know, <coughs> to a certain degree. And Serge will be able to correct me very quickly, being uh, from the ComScore perspective, but what's interesting is also that if today's people, you know, people's time spent on mobile is roughly 50% and growing, it's gonna go to 60, it's going to 70, and some prediction at some stage, we're all gonna be using, and including tablet, 90% of our time or consumption. So technically, tell me if this is incorrect, <laughs> all of the, the data story that we're talking about and compiling is somewhat irrelevant because in mobile, it's a cookie-less world. There are no cookies. So you can say that all this buildup of technology and the way that we've been driving this market is a moot point when it comes to mobile because there's DLID, there's s some limitations here or there. So are we at a, um, I guess I, I, I'm curious to know the other guy's thoughts, and am I right in saying that as it relates to yeah, on what mobile? Game, it's what very different. Mobile is clearly different. When you have a yeah, tap you, tap you have, mobile. There is an IDFA search. or whatever the oh. thing is, but yeah, no, absolutely. Oh. Yeah, advertiser IDs are obviously an alternative to a cookie, but I think at the end of the day, advertising campaigns are running on data, and we track billions of events a month from our clients' websites. And I think the data that we actually monitor is in many ways is more valuable than search data because it is that last mile. And we've reached a point right now in online advertising where human can no longer run show. You actually need to hand it over to the machines. The amount of data you collect from a single visitor on a website is, you know, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's how we got to decide where he's from, the kind of product he looked at, how many times was he at that website before, did he spend, he didn't, what kind of products and how consistent is the browsing behavior. And if you're trying to optimize by looking at spreadsheets and Excel and putting that to work, you know, it's going to be one miserable human being. Um, machines seems to do better um, crunching that data and machine learning Algorithms and AI has obviously been improved over the years and foundations such as Amazon has made a lot of it much more accessible and easy. So, you know, it's not big data, it's huge data. And sometimes it's interesting to see that, you know, we can get better understanding of our customers' website than they do. Uh, it's so actually mind boggling. And, and the data, the yeah. data that I, I agree, I think the data is one component, the ad products are the other. And if you look at Twitter, they launched day one as a mobile company, native ad products, promoted tweets, yep. no traditional ad placements, and that part of their business technically, according to the street, is winning. Um, and Pinterest, uh, I guess in this quarter, is launching ad products geared towards the user experience. So the data piece, I, I personally believe there's too much obsession on the data alone, so I'm probably generally in the minority on this. I think the ad product, the quality of ad, the ad product and the timing of the ad product doesn't get enough airplay or conversation. And that's why effectively if you poll people in general, um, what, do, what do you think of advertising? You're never gonna hear a roaring, uh, you know, incredible response to, I, you know, I love the experience on my mobile device. There's always a, a general thumbs down. And, and I think a big driver of that is too much, too much data retargeting, not enough beauty, storytelling, you know, ad products that, that people actually like. So who, who, who helps your customers to, to, go, to go to that point, to get to that point? Yeah, because uh, you, you seem to be evangelists in this area. Yeah, you nod your head every time you, you have an argument. But who helps your customers? You know, uh, it, w what's interesting, though, is that not to be the non-evangelist, right? Uh, but the, I, I think you're right. The notion of identifying the natural break to find a consumer when they're most likely to be engaged in an advertiser's brand is, is dead on. Um, but interesting things start to develop. So, Serge, just even in the notion of the next metric that advertisers are now starting to push the publisher community on in view. Such what starts from a good place very quickly gets into a tiny little box that is another way for large advertisers to get more for less, right? Um, and you may want to talk a little bit about InView for, for those that don't the know about concept it. Of, it's such a simple concept. 
that we um, started two years ago. But like on TV, it's very easy. There is, how many people actually saw the commercial? And, um, and there's all sorts of different metrics to measure that stuff. But on online, with the growth of online over the years, and even on mobile, there was less so on mobile, but there was no concept of if, did this, this, if there was an ad campaign, first you have to ask is did that campaign reach my target audience? So if my target audience was males 18 to 34, did it reach my target audience? But the crazy part of it is that was the only metric available for advertisers then. Um, and then what happened is we introduced a metric saying, well, wait a second, you could have landed on the page, the 18 to 34, but did they actually view the ad? Because if they didn't view the ad, then what's the point? They didn't see it. They didn't, they got to the page, it was the right audience, but they didn't see the ad. So we introduced that and allowing, aligning the viewability of the ad and then cross-tabbing it based on the demographics has just changed, changed the landscape. And now we're seeing advertisers actually doing guarantees based on viewability, which is an interesting where this, th where this thing is going. It's not well, yet it's happening across. But what started as a great idea it has started quickly as a great become idea. a proxy for we <laughs> want a lower rate. But we're only going to value 50% of the inventory that you're providing us. And, and unfortunately, I think that's the problem with all metrics at some moment in time when it comes down to the exchange of money, <coughs> somebody is using the metric to try and get more leverage and get a better price. And that seems to happen very quickly in the digital space. I, I still think there's, a, there's this like marketing obsession with getting people to the website. And so only 1% of people who make it to a website will buy. So 99% of the people that get sent from wherever. Now Google, we see the traffic, 60 to 70% of the people Google send bounce off the first page. Think of that, 70% of the people never make it past the first page. So there's so, still this obsession and talk about getting people there. They're getting there, they're there. And the brands even have them coming because they know the brand, but they can't convert them. So I, I think there's such an, still an obsession, like get them there, get them there. And I feel like, who cares? Because 99% of them, even under the best algorithms, the best predictive models from Google, don't do anything. So I think really where we have to focus on when they get there, how do we touch them? How do we get them through? And, and from my perspective, websites are just stuck from the 90s. A website looks the same it did in, in 1995 when I started. And I think that's where we got to put our focus and sort of defocus off trying to get one more better click because it, it doesn't help. Tal, what is your take on that? I think everyone said uh, really intelligent stuff. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Okay, but Serge, so you wanted to say something to that before no, I no, tell. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So, so let's go a little on. Uh, and uh, so, especially the, the, the shifts in monetization, the terms in monetization, how, how this has evolved over the time and how this will evolve and go on. So, will, will you take that, Dan, or, or Chris, one of you? Sure. I'll, I'll give you a very simple insight um, year over year. And again, Ours is a business that is fundamentally an advertising-driven revenue business. Uh, we have a small portion of our business that is a subscription business through our social media platform, Ning. But fundamentally, we're, we're an advertising model. And it goes back to the very first question you asked about customer centricity. If you're not giving the customer what they want, your business doesn't grow. And it's the reason why yesterday, not only did we change our name, we presented for the first time Glam and now Mode Media at the Video New Fronts. Our greatest growth area has been around video. Um, and on a percentage basis, I will tell you that it has gone from being a single digit to a fairly solid double digit percentage of the amount of advertising that we sell. So the trends that we're seeing are very clearly away from standard media units um, and very clearly into video into content and native. And our business is profoundly different than it looked five years ago as a result of that. Chris, you said there's a, a major change to mobile traffic. We said it before, and, and this changes everything. Yeah, so what does this mean even for him at Mode Media when, when the, the device is different, when there's different devices, when there's mobile, uh, just like hell? 
Uh, we, we, talk, we also talked a little bit about offline, uh, where you said, okay, we have this multi-channel situation where people see on the mobile device what's going on, and they get information on the mobile device, but at the end, they, they don't buy mobile. They, they do different things to right. get away from that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, it, it just comes back to some of the, the, the more you know, basics of what, and a lot of this stuff probably isn't so much rocket science, but there's a lot of rocket science behind it, which is, um, um, what's good for the user. And again, in, 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 with mobile, not, not utilizing the entire screen, so much of mobile today has the small banners at the bottom, which are accidental clicks waiting to happen. Um, there should be more usage of the entire canvas. Uh, <coughs> and generally, I think um, if 2013 was the word for um, native, which was, and really what that means is just publishers being smarter about um, utilizing their platforms to develop new ad products, um, I think intent is going to be a, a, a very important driver for 2014 and on. I mean, Google's, ad bus Google's business was built on intent. That's what search is all about. And I think there's a lot we can learn based on the natural behavior that people actually do on their social gaming, um, um, reading content, swiping, all these things that, that people do, it offers up another signal of understanding what someone's doing or trying to do. And I think if we're able to capture that and do it in a, in a meaningful way um, that works well for other mediums, there's probably a lot of promise. But I think your point was, you know, there, it starts with the, so how does this happen? If the advertisers today are forcing publishers to buy crap, then that's what they're gonna offer them and that's why prices come down. The only way to hold the line technically is to get a publisher that's in high demand to say this is the price and go beat it if you're not willing to, to buy it. And Facebook and Twitter and other large owned and operated businesses have the p power and marketplace to do that. If you represent other, if you represent inventory, which is probably the, the broader um, group of publishers out there, it's more challenging to do. So it starts with the, most people blame the 22 year old media planner. So you know, most people blame the agency as, as far as the reason for the issue. I would say maybe it's actually the, it has to start with the publishers creating better inventory, then that, that will force the buyers. Easier said than done, but that's the, that's the idea. Yeah, no, our view is, it's, it's all similar, but um, you know, we see from our clients, from a monetization perspective, they look at everything from cross device. So I give you a great example is P&G has a bunch of campaigns going on right now on TV. Um, where they want to know how many people actually saw the commercial on TV and for that same folks of for that same group of individuals that saw the TV commercial how many of them went online but more importantly how many of them actually went and bought the product at the grocery store and how many of them actually bought a competitor's product based on the um, based on the commercial and following through all of that is how they, um, how we help them from a monetization perspective. But that's that's really the key. At the end of the day, is did they make a purchase, um, or else we're just all wasting our money. Robert. Well, I mean, I think from our perspective, I was, I was with a client yesterday who has a big retail operation in the home improvement area, and when we look at mobile, it's it's how do we take somebody who's in a web, who's on the web experience, and then they're going into the store, and how do we bridge the gap? Because a, di a digital consumer is in that space at all times, and that, that's what they're trying to figure out and struggle with. I, I go back to it again. I hate to preach a, a different story. I think internet advertising is, it's busted, and I think the the internet accounts it growing it's growing about 17 percent a year from a revenue perspective, and it's only a couple points of overall revenue in our industry in our in our in our world, and this is from 1995. Something's fundamentally wrong, and we keep doing the same models advertising, get in there, and I. I say again that the connection we can have with our customers, especially in mobile, and be present with them at all times is where we need to transcend digital commerce now and get it out of that advertising click to content. It's all about content where I think it's about connection and that's where commerce has to go into the connective space. Okay, um, get a little bit to your people, people working for you in your company, skill sets that you have. Uh, what, what kind of people work for Mode Media? What are you looking for? What are you missing the most? Well, I, I think there's always some basics that, uh, again, I'd be surprised on some level if everybody didn't share some variation of 
who's the highly motivated person, who's the person that is going to uh, be there longer and work harder than you'd ever ask. So with that being a given, right now what we're continuing to evolve from a hiring perspective, the workforce into are a mix of some very different specialties that didn't exist in our company several years ago, video being one of them, specialists around programmatic being another. And th those are two very specific areas that we see, and it's, uh, you know, again, I don't think we're gonna be unique in that, that as an advertising salesperson, if you don't have an understanding, even if you're not only focused on programmatic advertising of what that is doing to the advertising ecosystem and how you can help your client there, uh, then you're not going to be employable. Um, so those are two critical areas. Tall? <clears throat> I think that um, Israel was blessed with some of the most innovative companies um, early on that were extremely focused on marketing and traffic acquisition, etc. And as the advertising space evolved over the past few years, um, Israel was blessed with a lot of talent in that area. Um, some of the most dominating companies in uh, traffic acquisition, advertising, is based in Israel. So for us, um, Adexent has an office in Israel, it has an office in New York. It's extremely, it's far more easier to uh, find the relevant people there than New York because okay. The people who started working there in the late 90s, you know, that, that would, that would, uh, that's what was they're doing. And, and also data scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is this bridge between having the humans who are actually good at online advertising and have the understanding, the fundamental one, as well as the scientists who can turn that into code. Okay. Chris, yeah, we, like to, we look for people that like to work long hours for low pay. Um, Let's be honest. <laughs> no, we, uh, my, my two cents is we've actually... Um, Not San Francisco we, then, right? We've, uh, we've, we've failed miserably always trying to find the high-flying executive with the huge resume that everyone knows. We're not good at that. So we, we've taken a different stance to try to find people that actually don't even come from digital, that work from print, and you take a shot on them. And they, then they appreciate that you've taken a shot on them, and then they work their ass off for you. And then you kind of get the other two things. Good. <laughs> I'm not sure we do that, but... Um, <laughs> We, um, you know, finding data scientists is really hard. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, so what we've taken a stab, and, and I, but the one where I do agree with Chris is finding the s most senior talent and then coming into the organization, good luck. Um, from a culture, from, it just takes forever to get those people, and those people you'll know within six months they're gone. But what we've done, or six weeks, um, but what we've done is we've partnered actually, we've invested a lot in this as we've partnered up with a lot of different universities um, here in the US and, and in Europe, but um, with MIT, with um, University of Pennsylvania, with Kellogg's, all these different schools, and we get to know the professors, and we get to know really, really well, and then what ends up happening is the professors end up recommending the students to us. Do you pay them? Hungry. No, we go in and spend our time and give them time. lectures and do all of that stuff. So give them feedback okay. for their coursework. Thank you. Robert, last sentence. Okay, we, we have about 800 employees, half are Israeli, 400 in Israel, but we have two core values, be an owner and help others. That's why we volunteer and stuff. But we want people who are really passionate, kind of crazy, go want to look at the world like everyone else, and that's the company. So. Thank you very much for the panel. Thank you very much for listening.